All right, everybody, I want to go ahead and do some housekeeping stuff so we can get started right at 3.30. Hopefully you are here for the track two afternoon uh, pre-conference session of the Evergreen 2024 International Online Conference. We have this afternoon data, data everywhere, and I should say it is not necessarily afternoon where you are, it is afternoon where I am, second session of the day for the pre-conferences. Um, data, data everywhere with Kathy Lucier from the North of Boston Library Exchange. I am looking forward to her presentation, as I'm sure we all are. I do want to give a brief mention of some of our sponsors. This year, we have Equinox sponsoring the platform. That's our feed loop account for those of you participating that way as well as the Evergreen Community Development Initiative for helping us out with the captioning, always a valuable service. And then Stack Courier and Mobius are our pre-conference sponsors for the day today. So thank you all for being here. I will uh, stop sharing my screen so that Kathy can go ahead and get started. Oh, I think you're muted, Kathy. I am muted, of course. <laughs> Good start. Um, I am going to share, try to share my screen. Let's see how we're going to do, uh, do with this. So, can you see the presentation? Yes. All right. Good. Now let's see if I can make it big. Uh, Good time of day to everyone, since we don't know what time of day it is, um, but afternoon for me. Uh, thank you for joining me for the Data Data Everywhere um, pre-conference. As uh, Katie mentioned, I'm Kathy Lucier, um, and I'm just going to talk a little bit about me. That's me. I don't usually put my photos in presentations, but the cat insisted because he wanted to make sure I had as many photos of him as possible in here. So I am the executive director of the North of Boston Library Exchange. Um, we're a consortium of 25 public, academic, and special libraries in the uh, North Shore area of Massachusetts. I've only been here since July. Previously, I was the executive director of another consortium, the Sales Library Network, in the South Coast area of Massachusetts. And that's a non-evergreen consortium. Um, I won't mention any vendor names there, uh, but we did have 62 public school and academic libraries. And a lot of the experience that I'm bringing to this presentation is, um, happened while I was working at the Sales Network. And prior to that, I was the coordinator of the Massachusetts Library Network Cooperative, MassLink, um, which was a collaborative among Evergreen using consortia and libraries. So um, I'm bringing to this presentation a lot of experience in managing a system for libraries and their data, um, and also in under understanding Evergreen's functionality and how it could possibly make things better when it comes to protecting the privacy and confidentiality of our users. Okay. So our goals for today, um, I'm going to share my experiences from performing a privacy audit. I'm not an expert by any means. You all had an expert speak about patron privacy back in 2021. Um, Becky Yost, who was wonderful, and um, I'm not going to pretend that I have a level of expertise, but there are a lot of lessons I learned through uh, going through a privacy audit, and it really was just a small piece of what you could actually do with these. Um, to do. So as part of this, I just want to give you a heads up. I will be collecting feedback from all of you as we go through this, because I don't think you want me talking to you the whole time. Um, this is the third group I've done this presentation for. The first one is for the unnamed vendor group. Um, and then I did one with Jeanette Lundgren, who's here. So Jeanette, you're going to hear a lot of what you've already heard from me um, for libraries in New England. So it's time for Evergreen to get this presentation. But you're all lucky. You get a full two hours. No one else has gotten that yet. So um, I, I want to try to make it as interactive as possible. Uh, and then... What we're, I'm also going to do is try to provide you with some tools so that to help you improve your policies and procedures for managing sensitive patron data. 
And um, the other thing I'd like to do as part of this session is see if we all as a group can identify some ways we could improve Evergreen to better protect patron data. And, you know, when I go to sessions about privacy in libraries and how to improve privacy, quite often they'll say, go with open source software because you know how they're collecting data. You know what the code's doing to um, all of that information there. It's a better option. So what I would love to see is for Evergreen to be at a point where we could just go out there and say, Evergreen, that is the ILS uh, to use for protecting patron confidentiality. So that is my secret goal in uh, bringing this presentation to everyone in the community. All right. So I'm gonna share our feedback tool with you. So I am putting this link in the feed loop chat and Katie, you're going to share it in the um, Zoom chat. Is that yeah, right? Yeah, can do. And this is called Padlet. And I thought we'd have a nice little icebreaker exercise so that um, you all could learn to use Padlet and have a little bit of fun. So this is something where you can just kind of put sticky notes up. And so if you click on the link that I just shared and put hit the plus button, you'll see a little pop up that allows you to write something. So what I'm gonna ask you to do, if you are willing to share your name, that would be good so that I know who is here, um, but you don't have to share your name. And the question I'm asking you is, if we were to have an official evergreen cookie, what flavors do you think should be in it? So if you hit the plus button and start writing in that note, you should get a publish button from there. And then it should pop up for everyone to see. I am not going to comment on the oatmeal cookie one. And as you see them pop up, you'll also see there's a place where you can add a comment. So if you wanted to uh, comment on somebody else's idea, you could do that there. Or if you wanted to like someone else's idea, you could always um, hit the little heart to show that you uh, support that idea. And anyone who knows me knows that there's probably, if I'm talking about an official evergreen cookie, I'm probably planning to do it. And I'm also gonna try to stop myself from going and looking at the link for the foraged evergreen cookie. All right, so as you can see, this should be an easy tool to use. And as we get further along in my presentation, we will um, we'll go in and use it for something a little bit more useful than cookies, but nothing nearly as fun as cookies. So I'm gonna move on. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about trust because quite often, especially recently, when we, hear studies about what people think about libraries, we often hear the uh, word trust. So I, I put up some quotes from some studies over the past few years, and this isn't necessarily in uh, regards to pa uh, 
patron data or patron privacy, but you know, um, the Pew Research Center, Center study that says libraries are a place to find trustworthy information. Um, every library institute uh, just recently did a study where parents have a high level of trust in both school librarians and public librarians, urban libraries councils. Libraries are highly trusted institutions that cultivate social capital in the communities they serve. It, it's a word that's often used when we talk about libraries. And I think that's why really being sure we're doing everything we can to protect patron privacy and confidentiality is important because the one thing you don't wanna do is uh, destroy that trust. There's the um, old saying, trust takes years to build, seconds to break and forever to repair. Um, and you don't wanna be in a position where you really need to repair that trust. And specifically where I am in Massachusetts, a few years ago, right before uh, we were starting our privacy audit, the Boston Public Library had the cybersecurity incident. And I think anyone who went to the conference last year saw David Leonard's uh, presentation about that. Unfortunately, I had to miss it. Um, but that was something that we were keeping in mind is that if something like that happens at your library, at your consortium, you wanna show your public that you've done everything you can to protect their data. Um, I'm curious, and I don't even know how I get an answer to this question in this conference platform, but how many people here come into the session with the uh, I belief that most people don't care about privacy, only the librarians care about privacy? Is that something people believe? Uh, so you could answer in, in the chat or uh, the Zoom chat or the Feed Loop chat, or you can use the, um, if you're in Feed Loop, you can go to the more in the blue bar and use the reactions. Um, and you can use those if you're in Zoom as well. Well, and Ruth is saying that they have a lot of people who are very concerned about it. So that's good to hear. And then we have Heather who says, I would say that more people care about it than don't. Andrea uh -huh. says, totally anecdotally, the people in my life are far less concerned about their privacy than their convenience. I'm constantly having this conversation. And Ben, oh, hi, Ben. Um, we certainly have some patrons who are annoyed about the features we don't offer by default in order to protect their pol pol privacy. Um, and then we also have Allison from Westchester. Lots of people care. I'm surprised by the number of library staff who aren't aware. Um, that is a good point. I found that too. And then Stephanie, I think people are very concerned about it in the abstract, but have no idea how to improve their situation with specific apps and settings. And then Joan Cranick, people may say they're concerned, but their actions don't show it. I think one thing I try to keep in mind is that the moment when your public is gonna most care about their privacy is the moment you have a data breach or something that um, where their data has been taken. Um, so even if you're in contact with people who are saying that, once that kind of breach happens, it, that's when you're suddenly going to hear that they care about it. And I, I think like one example we saw of this with Facebook was the Cambridge Analytica information. When that came out, I, I think I noticed a huge increase in people starting to pay attention to privacy and what the internet was doing with their information at the time. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. And another point I tried to make is a lot of times there's this thought that to better protect privacy, you have to, um, you have to take away some customer service. Um, you have to make things less customer friendly. But you, you know, improving your privacy practices, there is a customer service component to that. And so that's something you gotta keep in mind. 
the people who most appreciate that may not be the people who are at your CERC desk every day. They may be the, be the people who are using the self-check all the time because, the, you know, they're so worried about what they're reading. They don't even want the library staff to see what it is. They may be people who are using your online tools at home and just want to make sure that that da data is protected. So there is a customer service component to protecting that data as well. And these are probably talking points you should bring up if you ever are doing a privacy audit, because you know there will be some library staff who have concerns about giving up what they see as um, you know tools to provide good customer service in the name of protecting that data. So, ooh, I am obviously having trouble going through my slides at the moment. There we go. So there is my cat again, Q-tip. Um, I hope there are cat people in this crowd. And the reason he has that name, I don't know if you can see it in the slide, but right at the tip of his tail is a little bit of white. And that is where he gets his name, Q-tip. Um, and what I love about this photo is that, um, yes, Bradley, I know there are cat people. <laughs> that right now Q-tip thinks he is hidden from the entire world and that nobody knows where he is. But of course, everyone sitting in my living room at this moment when I took this picture knows exactly where he is because there his tail is right out for everybody to see. What we don't want is our data to be in that kind of situation. You want your data to be secure. You don't want it sticking out where some kind of hacker could actually knows easily how to get at it. All right. So I'm gonna go over some definitions before we get started. Um, privacy, the right to open inquiry without having the subject of one's interest examined or scrutinized by others. Um, these are definitions I got from ALA. Confidentiality exists when a library is in possession of that personally identifiable information about users and keeps that information private on their behalf. Um, I saw this wasn't in a library publication, but I saw one explanation that really made sense to me. Privacy pertains to people, whereas confidentiality pertains to data. Privacy is a right that can be violated, whereas confidentiality is an agreement that can be broken. So if you have the right to privacy, you have the right to share, not share some information, but with confidentiality, they've already shared that information with you and you are keeping it private for them. Um, personally identifiable information, I'm going to be saying this a lot in the, this presentation as PII, so that's often um, called in shorthand PII, um, and that's the um, information that we want to keep um, confidential. Um, you know, the worst, the most sensitive of that information could be things like social security number, uh, driver's license number. But then there are other pieces of it um, that we have to be concerned about that you could link back to a person. And, and speak for the library perspective, a big piece of that is their intellectual pursuits, which, go, which goes to what is it they're checking out from the library? What are they reading about? And we need to make sure that that information remains confidential as well. Um, explicit consent, that's when people are given the option to agree or disagree with the collection of data. So um, some, that's, um, that's where you would actually have them give explicit consent or to opt in to having certain data collected as opposed to the other where you just collect it and then they opt out of it. Um, and you tend, we want to make sure that patrons are giving explicit consent whenever they can. So I'm, I'm gonna talk about a process I went through at my last consortium um, when we did a privacy audit and um, you know this was on the heels of COVID and we felt like we didn't have enough on our hands so why not go do a privacy audit although you know 
COVID was part of the reason we decided to do this because we had a lot of staff in our libraries who took their laptop homes and for the first time they were accessing our systems um, from home on a regular basis where they hadn't previously been doing that. And it led to the question of, okay, staff know that when they're in the library, they need to keep this information confidential, or at least I hope they did. But now they're bringing it home and their kids are running around while they're accessing the system or their spouses. And we wanted to make sure people were aware and still maintaining those um, practices that they did, um, had in the workplace and bringing them home with them. Uh, so we started off by just getting people talking about this topic. Um, so at our annual meeting in uh, June 2021, we had Becky Yost come in and it was right after a month or two after she had presented for the Evergreen Conference, just to talk about the idea and things we should be looking at. Um, and then we pulled together a task force, mostly of directors, um, that was formed to formulate recommendations re related to any policy and procedures that would have a direct impact on staff or patrons. Um, our consortium staff, this wasn't, we didn't expect our library staff to do, do this, performed a data inventory. And then we ran an audit against the, um, a checklist from ALA. They have several checklists uh, related to privacy audits. This one was specific to library management systems and integrated library systems. So, um, I'm gonna skip this slide because I think I repeat this information later on and forgot to remove that slide. So this is kind of the steps that really will help your library uh, improve their privacy stance. The data inventory, this is where you find all of the PII your organization is storing. And when we did this, we just focused on the consortium itself and not our, each of our individual libraries uh, because our hope was that from this, we could learn uh, and share that information with our library so that they could, um, you know, uh, benefit from what we were learning of our own practices. And then we performed the privacy audit using these checklists from the American Library Association, and that helped us identify areas for improvement and where we came up with a lot of recommendations uh, to better protect our patron data. Um, and then the next piece of the toolkit, which we didn't get to um, because I left, but um, was to do a review of our privacy po policy and to make it clear and easy for the average user to understand. And in some places you might do this, the privacy policy first. I didn't want to do it first because I knew we would be updating the policy all along as we made changes based on rec the recommendations that came out of our audit. Uh, and then I figured once it was an accurate policy, then we could really review it. But um, I know other people would do the privacy policy review first. So we'll talk a little bit more detail about the data inventory. And I say resist the urge to close the door on the accumulation of data that has built up over time. And what I mean by that is as I started going through this process, it, it, it's, it's an overwhelming process and, and you have to take things in chunks. But it, I, it kept reminding me of this room I have in my house. It's, we call it the office. Um, we don't use it as an office. It, it had literally started out as the bedroom for my two children. And then when they reached a certain age where they needed their, they each needed their own bedroom, we basically first moved my son into what had been the office and moved all the stuff from the office up to this room. And then we got my daughter into another room. And this was actually the first year I started at MassLink and my kids were like, nine and six and basically all of the stuff we moved up into the, what was the new office never really got unpacked the way it should have so it became the junk room right if anyone else are out there have a junk room um but it was this thing where you know that there's this stuff piling up and there's stuff that you have to do with it and I would walk by it every once in a while and look at it and then I just kind of close the door and pretend it's not there and I know I used to do this with our system at 
field uh, where I used to work where so every once in a while you'd see some data and it's like that data probably shouldn't be there but you know that if you start working on that this you're going to open up this big rabbit hole and you're never going to be able to uh, finish the project yeah I had to stop closing that door and had to actually open it up and see what was there um, you know, my husband was good with this room. He would actually, every once in a while, clean it up and move all of the stuff around. But moving it doesn't help. You actually have to throw it up. You have to throw it out. You have to get 1-800-GET-JUNK and just get it out of there. Um, and that's what, you, you know, by going through the data inventory, that's what you hope the end result will be, is that you can get rid of some of this. So... I got all levels of staff involved in this data inventory. And when I say all levels of staff, this was our consortium staff. This was not our library staff, but it wasn't just um, the librarians there. I had our administrative assistant going through her stuff. We were also looking at employee data at the same time because it made sense just to look at that all at the sa um, same time because it's very similar information. And we ask them, identify where you see any PII in the organization. You look for paper form. So if it were a library level, you'd be looking for the library applications, the online forms, the emails, uh, local files, or, or if you are working uh, with Google Workspace or Microsoft OneDrive, what do you have in there? Um, any third-party software outside of the ILS. So like we had in like analytics software that um, every day harvested data from our ILS, you know, what was in there. Uh, social media sites, is, is there any pr uh, personal information there? Um, and then you gather all of this information in one location. And we used a Google form, and I think I shared so that, can you see the form itself? Or is it still in the presentation? Yeah, we've got the form. Okay, okay. perfect. Um, and I basically had every staff member for every time they found PII, they, uh, you were supposed to describe it, um, what data was collected, name, address, um, phone number, all of this stuff, you know, social security number. The reason we have that there is because, like I said, we were doing this for um, some of our employee practices, too. We do not store we never collect patron social security numbers. Uh, driver's license numbers, we don't collect that either, but any of that kind of information. Um, intellectual pursuits, so that would be the uh, patron's borrowing history, holds history, web searches, anything like that. And then I'd have them check off where it's saved. Um, if it was in Google Drive, who has access to the drive? How is it deleted or destroyed? In most cases, people were checking off. I have no process set up to delete it. You know, I sent it out there with the note that don't worry about getting in trouble, that you have this data that we want to get rid of. We just want to find out where it is. This isn't an exercise to try to uh, punish people for um, having that data anywhere. Uh, and by the time we were done with this, we had a lot of stuff in our spreadsheet telling us where this data was. Okay. Let's see if I can get back to my presentation. Yes. Um, and I'll keep the link to that form in the presentation when I share it after the conference, but just please don't submit it because it actually will go to uh, an organization I don't work for for anymore. So um, they know I'm doing this, but they don't want to suddenly start getting uh, all this random data. So I think I went through this. Um, what information is collected? The other thing I, I didn't mention in that form is a big question. Why do we collect it? Is it necessary? And as we went through the results of the inventory, that was the first question I always wanted to ask is, do we even need that information at all? And, and that's a really important question. So we shine the light on the uh, data. Um, you know, we found it revealed a lot of patterns um, on how we were transferring and storing and accessing data. So even if this is the only part you can do is the data inventory, I think it's helpful. Um, 
because you start to see the patterns and there may be in some cases just a few tweaks to to stop you know having people put all their stuff uh with pii that's on their google drive in one folder that gets cleared out monthly or something like that um the other nice thing about it is that by getting all the staff involved it really raised awareness throughout the organization uh, of, about privacy and really thinking about the data and where we keep it. It was, you know, you're building a culture of privacy in your organization. And it was great, you know, to hear my administrative assistant should all suddenly start complaining about vendors we worked with when they were sending things over email that really shouldn't be sent via email. And she would immediately start grumbling about them. And you never heard that from her before. So it, even just doing the inventory and raising that awareness moves your organization forward. Um, best results is to perform the inventory on a regular basis. As I said, I left the organization, so we never got to do that. But, you know, hopefully if you're doing on this on an annual basis, it becomes easier to do when it's not quite a um, big mess like it is when you're cleaning out the junk room. So that was the data inventory. We next, we actually did the data inventory in conjunction with the privacy audit. But what the audit is, is uh, procedures to ensure that your organization goals and promises of privacy and confidentiality are supported by its practices. And I emphasize the word promises because again, this is a trust issue. We have promised to our public that unlike all these other online sites that are constantly tracking them, that we're libraries, we're good, we don't do that, we protect your data. And this is how you fulfill that promise. If you're just saying that and not doing anything about it, then, then you're really not protecting their data. So the ALA checklists, um, there are multiple checklists available from ALA to help you in doing an audit. Um, I didn't see if he's here, but thank you to Galen Charlton who actually sent me the link to get me started on this um, where I found these checklists. But as you can see, there is a checklist that's just a general privacy audit. Um, we have one for assistive technology. Uh, data exchange between networked devices and services. That is important for any consortium or library to look at. Um, the one I, we focused on was library management systems and integrated library systems. Um, but we were planning to move on after this first one to discovery services and also um, K to 12 schools because we had 23 K to 12 schools in the consortium I was running then. And things were getting hairy there. Um, uh, the way we handled their data was different than how we handled it for public libraries we, for reasons that, you know, um, schools have different obligations than the public libraries do. But we were starting to get questions for reports that I did not like running because, as you know, things are... Um, people are overly concerned, more concerned than usual with what the libraries have. So we really wanted to go through that and see if there were policies we could put in place to better protect that. But this is the one we, we started with. The reason we didn't do them all at once was I wanted to see progress, even if it was for a small piece of the puzzle. And when I saw all of these checklists, I thought that is going to take forever to get through them. So I just figured, let's start with the first checklist. So as you can see, each checklist has priority one, and then priority two, and priority three items. And what they mean by priority, it's not about the, the importance. The priority one items are things that any library should be able to do. It doesn't matter if you're a, in a small rural town with just a few staff members with no technical ability. These are things you should be able to handle at that level. And then when you go up to priority two actions, it starts to be a little more difficult. You need to have 
the ability to configure notices in a certain way, for example, or um, there's more uh, uh, technical knowledge that goes and gets involved in it. And then priority three uh, is the most difficult level. So our girl goal was to do just the priority one and two items so that we could uh, make it a manageable task, except this one, which you don't have to worry about in the Evergreen community. That was priority three and is something that our my old um, consortium needed to deal with, so um, password encryption. So that is something we um, included in our first pass because in my mind, that was very uh, critical to take care of. And, um, you know, we focused on one checklist, priority one and two, and then put out recommendations so that we could have some change immediately, rather than spending a year or two going through all of these checklists and trying to get it perfect. And I, I think if there's any message I want to give you is, you know, don't worry if you don't get it all done. Any changes you make in the name of privacy are moving in the right direction. Even going through these prior priority one and two items, there were some things there that I know I we just weren't ready for yet. Um, you know, going back to my example of my junk room, there are some items I'm going through it now because I want to move. And there are some things that we don't need to keep, but we're not ready to let go of it yet. But there were some steps for privacy that I know we need needed to make someday, but I knew we weren't ready for it. And that was fine because this should be an iterative process. This is something you should do on a regular basis. So maybe we're not ready now, but if we go through this checklist again in three years, we're ready to take on that next step, but just slow progress, it's fine. So that's what the checklist looked like. Uh, I talked about the priorities. And then ALA also has these guidelines and they go along with the checklist. So I'm also gonna bring up the one for library management systems. So as an example, if I go to a checklist, it will say uh, a couple of them are about minimization. Collect the minimum amount of personal data necessary for library operations. Regularly review what personal data is collected. So data is required. So that's a checklist item that you have to look into. The guidelines give you a little bit more information about what to look for, the reasons behind why this is important in a privacy audit. So when I go here to collection and retention of user data, I get a little bit more information. Libraries should minimize the amount of personal data they collect. They should limit that amount to only the information required to provide a service or meet a specific operational need. Library policies about personal data should also cover the use of any free text note fields. Um, that is really an area where you, you want to look in your audit note fields associated with the user's record. Collecting some types of data puts users at risk for harm if the data is breached or improperly used. Libraries should assess their direct operational needs before considering the collection of high risk sensitive data, such as government or organization issued identification numbers, so that's social security number, driver's license number, student ID, library use history, other than what you're checking out. So this is the um, other ways they're using the library or behavior. So again, look at your patron notes when it comes to behavior. Are, are people talking about patron behavior in those notes? Um, demographic information. Uh, for example, gender identity, race, ethnicity, employment, all of that um, kind of information. So it gives you examples of what to look for. Uh, and then you get collecting this information may conflict with Article 7 of the Library Bill of Rights. Libraries should ask themselves the following questions when they want to collect personal data in a free text field. Why does a library need to collect that data? What is it being used for? Will the service not work if the data isn't collected? Who has access to it? How long does it need to be kept? Um, 
and then it goes along on about not keeping data in perpetuity and things like that. So the two work uh, alongside each other. One thing I want to mention about the fact that we're using an ALA uh, checklist, that I, I don't know if it, it would be like this in your library or consortium, but when I was communicating with our member libraries about this, it was important to point out that the checklist was there as a guide to help us find where potential issues might be, but that it was our task force that was making decisions about what to do about that. Because if you put too much emphasis on ALA, there are people who might bristle at the idea of a um, national organization telling them what you should be doing with data. Uh, and, you know, and I think it's probably gotten even worse now than it did in 2021 with this, but it, um, I, I, even some of our directors was like, well, that's ALA, that's not, they don't know what we have to deal with. So it, it, I, I just think it's important to constantly reiterate, this is just a tool to help us, and deter, but that our local people are the ones making decisions. So we went through the checklist um, and how we handled it is our consortium staff reviewed the action items that came out from this checklist. Uh, so we had, uh, we separated them. We had internal actions. These are things that we looked at and we clearly saw a way we could address the, the problem. Um, and it didn't really at impact patrons, it didn't impact staff workflow. Um, as an example, we had a month, uh, regular reports that we ran for some of our libraries that had PII in it that were um, just simply emailed in the body of the email, the results of the report. And our in analytics software though, um, had an option to send it in an encrypted zip file. That was an easy thing to do. We didn't have to check with anyone ahead of time to see if that was okay. We just made that change and um, it was a, a password protected uh, file too. And just, you know, worked with our libraries on implementing that. And then we had other items that came up that impacted staff, it impacted the public. And those are the things that went to our audit task force. So I think I mentioned early on, there, there were mostly directors on this task force. Um, it was brought up at one of our members meeting and one of the directors said, oh, she thought it was a great idea. The first one who said that was also someone I knew cared about privacy. And I said, oh, good, I'm glad you like it. You'll be the chair. And I, th I think it's important that you make sure that at least some of the people on this task force really do care about protecting patron privacy. Um, we also had someone from our CERC policy committee on there because that's the um, staff person at the library who's going to be impacted the most by doing a privacy audit and whatever recommendations go forward. And we needed that perspective as well. Having a, um, if you have multiple multi-type libraries in con your consortium, having those represented there. We had a school library person. Um, we didn't get an academic one, but that's because we only had one academic library by that point. Um, so that wasn't too bad. So the privacy audit task force went through those items and started talking about them and how we might want to handle them. And then from that, we got a, a survey that we sent out to membership to get their feedback on specific issues. Uh, and through that survey, the task force came up with recommendations. Um, we sent the recommendations out. We had a large Zoom call to, so that staff at any level could participate, ask questions, raise concerns. You know, having this kind of staff interaction really helps build up your level of buy-in for the process. Um, and, and it's also helpful for us because we found out as part of the process, and I'm not quite sure why we didn't already know this, but um, I, I think I mentioned one of our issues was, you know, we needed passwords that were encrypted. We could actually see our patron passwords in the system. And 
we found out as part of this process, well, our statewide ILL system, if you're a staff member placing an ILL request on behalf of a user, it required you to provide their barcode and PIN, which means if you didn't weren't able to look up the PIN, how could you place that request on behalf of a user? And it was as part of this process of putting things out there that we were able to realize that this was a big issue and contact our state agency and say, hey, we need to work with this vendor to say, change their software because this isn't okay. Um, and we were able to change the software within a month um, of after we um, got the pins uh, hashed and salted and all of that. So um, it really is important to have those discussions with staff. Then by our April members meeting, we had a vote. And the big thing was because we followed this process, there were no surprises by the time our members were voting on it. There were concerns, there were discussions, disagreements, but they all knew what was coming before we brought it to them. So let me see what time is. Okay, so we're gonna do our first Padlet exercise. And I, showed you a little bit of what those priority one items are. I'm, I'm going to do a link. Uh, I'm going to share a link to those priority one items in case you want to look at them again. And then the link to the Padlet. And the question I have is, which one of these are issues for your library? So I think if you look at them, you're going to see that there are some things that immediately come up as without you even having to think about it as issues in your consortia if you haven't already done that already. So let me send you the Padlet. This one does not have any liking of the um, things that are there, but if you wanna add some things there and you can certainly comment on other people's if you have any questions or wanna expand upon it. Um, so, you know, Take some time to look at those and see if you can figure out something, you know, some areas that you could improve in your library based on those priority one items and what they are and add them to a Padlet. And if you have any questions, feel free to put them in chat. Oh, and also, if you're a service provider, because I see a few of you here, um, obviously, you're not at a library, but if there are things you know ha are happening in libraries that you help, you could certainly add those there, too.
Okay, it looks like things are slowing down. And I just want to thank all of you because I feel so much better about the things we found in our own audit because I see you're finding some of the same things that I thought we are, are we the only ones with this problem? So yes, um, I see a lot about unique logins for staff members. That's something actually we have at Noble that happened before I got here. So that's nice. A lot about privacy policies. Um, oh, the the newsletter list, the third party mailing list, um, that is a good one that we talked about and I wasn't really happy with the solution we came up with, which was leave it in the hands of the library director to decide, but it was, it was something. Um, data retention on photocopiers. So yeah, and the other thing with that is we discovered when you scan things from a copier that the um, email, um, if you do it via email, that the email's left in the sent folder. So setting up that email account to automatically delete those, um, you know, things you never, uh, and that wasn't even a consortium thing. We were hearing about it from libraries. Um, Yep, this, this all looks familiar. Um, minimization and aggregation for report purposes. We need a better idea of what might be necessary to keep for future report asks versus privacy. I also wanted, I thought I had it in my um, notes to talk about this, but I didn't. Uh, one of the things on the checklist, I just need to find it, I want to get the right language right, is um, so aggregation, aggregate personal data and report to the greatest extent possible. Periodically review reports to check that they are not revealing personal data. Does I don't know if everyone understands what that means, but there is a, um, I have an example and it's actually in an evergreen bug report. So can you now see a launch pad bug up? Yep. Okay, good. So, so this is a great ex example, a, a bug report that was submitted by Jeff Davis. And it's about how um, when we are aging our CERCs, we keep the postal code and the birth year. And that the two together, in a, when you're looking at statistics, could actually uniquely identify patrons. So uh, think about it this way. You're in a small town, maybe someone who was born in uh, 1924, like they're 100 years old. How many people in this zip code actually were born in 1924? So if you're keeping statistics about them and reporting statistics in that way, or even just, I shouldn't even say that you're reporting them, that basically there is data being stored in your evergreen database that has um, uniquely identified a user and we're keeping, and you can see what titles they checked out even after you've aged the circulation. So that's what they mean by aggregation. And I will tell you this bug is, I believe has a, no, it doesn't have the pull request. Uh, I actually uh, sent a, uh, we put a message on it over the weekend, and I don't know why Rogan didn't work on it over the weekend, but um, he did have code there to uh, make it so that you don't collect those two pieces of information, so you have an option there. So that's what that uh, bug report is getting at. So, um, you know, there's a case where we have a concrete way we could actually improve privacy in the system if we move forward with that. It has a pull request, but it was so long, I didn't know if it needed to be rebased again. That was all, but we could always, and I couldn't test it because I was doing last minute work on a presentation. So, those are the types of things you would be looking for in an audit. We're almost at the one hour point and I like to give a break. So how about if we take a break for about 10 minutes and meet back here at 435 and then we can uh, move forward? Does that sound good for everyone?
and I'll stop sharing. You want to come back at uh, 35? Is that what you said, Kathy? Yeah, so it would be a 10-minute okay. break, 435. Perfect. Great.
Kathy, I think we can be ready whenever you are. I am ready. Okay. I got myself hydrated. Good. <laughs> I needed a snack. Is it the cookies that did it? <laughs> because I was going to do the question as what uh, song would you pick if you did karaoke with nobody listening? But mm. I just, um, I went the cookie angle instead. <laughs> Okay. We don't need to talk about that here because we don't we only do karaoke at live conferences or in person ones. I'm just trying to remember how to share my screen. Give me a second. Perfect. Okay. So I'm going to go through, so we, uh, when we last left, we uh, talked about the process of going through the checklists, and I highlighted a bug, and Rogan says he's going to look to see if it needs to be rebased, but I'm only mentioning that because I would like to bring attention to the bug. Um, maybe it's something we can get in for the next Evergreen release. Wouldn't that be exciting to get a uh, improvement to our privacy practices for the next release? Um, so... Here are some of the findings we had in the org my own organization when we went through this audit. And uh, just to let you know, I'm about to go through this whole process again, um, starting next fall with Noble. So, you know, I'm happy to talk about how that process went at next year's Evergreen Conference. Um, but that's just a way of saying this, you know, the process didn't kill me. I'm willing to do it again. So it, it was a good thing. Um, so one thing we found is we were exchanging a lot of private information over email. Um, and, and that to me is problematic. Um, email can be intercepted. That wasn't my biggest concern. It's more how easily it, is, it can just move around. Um, you can forward it, you can copy people on it, you, re you reply all to it. Um, Quite often, these were in support requests that we got from libraries. So your handle, if it's a tricky support request, you start copying other people in it, and then maybe they forward it to their IT person. Um, and it goes, this thread goes on forever, and you lose sight of the fact that way back in the beginning part of the message was a whole bunch of um, personal information in it. Um, Email accounts get hacked. Everyone knows somebody with an account who got hacked. Um, they're also easily accessible to family members, especially you have them on your phone. Is How hard is it for a family member to grab it and open, it and open up the email? Um, email can be misdirected to the wrong person. Uh, it happens all the time. So a, a huge thing we did was just trying to stop using email for everything that had patron information in it. Um, and then the other big thing was on our hard drives and in our Google Workspace folders, we were saving a lot of file with patron information and we had no processes set up to remove these files. So that was something we needed to get a handle on. Uh, all right. And then for some specific things we looked at, um, collection of unnecessary information. If you don't collect it, you don't have to worry about someone taking it or you don't have to worry about getting rid of it. So um, we found a couple of places where we thought we were collecting unnecessary information. Um, statistical categories, they weren't called statistical categories, but I'm multilingual, my, multilingual when it comes to ILS, so I have translated it. Um, and date of birth were the two areas we looked at. Uh, our statistical categories uh, or local libraries could choose what data was collected. Most libraries were using codes from the last century, and I am not exaggerating here. It was from the last century. Uh, the consortium I was with, Sales, they uh, had it had formed in 2000, and it was the merger of two different consortia in our state, SEAL and ABLE. 
And when they merged, there was, uh, as part of the merger, there was this disagreement over what codes could be used for their statistical categories. So basically, it was left to the libraries. And the ones from SEAL kept using the SEAL codes. The ones from ABLE kept using the ABLE codes. So they, they made these categories uh, pretty useless. Um, they they must have at that time only had one statistical category that they were available to use for each patron because basically it was a con code that concatenated a bunch of um, you know, gender, age, primary language information. So they really weren't understandable until you'd been using them for a while. We did have some libraries that used something different than everyone else that had things like voting precincts and census tracts. So again, when you're looking at the aggregation of data, um, it, it starts to narrow in the field of, of who's in there. They were very difficult to read. It was a training issue for new CERC staff. Nobody knew what they meant. And I don't think anyone was even using the reports we generated on a monthly basis that showed these codes. And the reason I say that is because when I people ask, well, what's wrong with the, the codes we have now? And I'd show them the report that say, oh, I've never seen that report. So we were generating these on a monthly basis and they, they were useless because every library in the network was using a different code. So you know, the patron from your neighboring community comes and checks something out, you don't recognize what that code means. It, it, so it, it was more than just a, a data issue. Um, we didn't wanna collect gender information anymore. Uh, primary language would be fine if there was a useful purpose for it. And the software had since developed functionality to do notices in those languages, but that information wasn't stored in the right place for that. Um, so we, we moved to the broad H-based categories that a lot of libraries had already moved to when they were reconsidering the collection of gender information. So we, it, we recommended it. I mean, every consortium is different. This is Massachusetts. Sometimes your best bet is to go with a recommendation. You can't really enforce it on people, um, but we recommended that they go with just senior, adult, young adult, juvenile. Um, and then we gave them a carrot. We said, if you do that, we will make sure that your categories get updated automatically based on birth dates. So you don't have to worry about that anymore. But if you use these antiquated codes, we, we're not gonna do that because it's too much work. Um, the good news was every single library got rid of the old codes. Um, so it, it, even though it was just a recommendation, um, we had a lot of success with it. The, the other one was date of birth um, investigated because this is highly sensitive, um, can make identity theft easier. Uh, we floated the idea of maybe using a statistical category with year of birth so you could still get some kind of age statistics, but um, without really narrowing in on their date of birth. Uh, another idea was in case you wanted to have automatic automatic updates working that it would uh, be July 1st and then year of birth for the date of birth. So we floated those ideas. Um, ultimately, our task force decided to keep collecting this information um, because they determined it supported a specific operational need, which was mainly preventing the creation of duplicate patron records. And I, I'm curious about other libraries because we have this discussion in Massachusetts quite a bit. Um, it, are there other libraries that require a date of birth or do, do a lot of you, have you all, some of you decided not to do that? So Heather says, yes, they, they do it. In King County, yep, for the same reason. And then we have, uh, so it looks like there's a mix. And in Samson, North Carolina. So yeah, that's that's one. It, it's, it really is a sensitive piece of data. It's, it, I think if it were like a single library, it might be a little bit different than if it's a consortium where you have so many um, 
you know, such a wide geographic area and so many common names, uh, names that people have in common. You just really need it for the duplicate check on, checking. Um, and so Dan says they require it, which we didn't. This change was made during the pandemic to support our introduction of self-registration since some of our libraries didn't want to allow patrons under a particular age to register without parental permission. Yeah, that's a, um, and this is why we've been having the discussion a lot in Massachusetts because we have the online registration that we moved to and they certainly recommend it for duplicate checking um, with the online registration. And we had some consortia who had issues with that because they had never required it in the past. So um, that was a case where we made no changes. So retention periods, we investigated this. Uh, so it says, you know, PII should not be retained in perpetuity. Uh, the library should establish policies for how long to retain different types of data and methods for securely destroying data that is no longer needed. For example, accounts that are expired or enacted for a certain amount of time should be purged. Um, retention policy should also cover archival copies and backups. So when we explored this que question of retention period, we really relied heavily on that operational need. Um, we were maintaining transactional data, not date, for a year after the transaction closed. Um, but then there was, a, I mean, there were a couple pieces of this. Were we actually following that pet policy was the first question. So in our data inventory that we did on early on, we had found that this wasn't always being followed. So we had data in our analytics software. It, it um, harvested data from the system every day and when that year hit that data wasn't being updated so the analytics system had all of those historical transactions even though we were anonymizing it in the ILS so we had to run a process to take care of that um, and then we also found we were anonymizing circulation data but not the holds data so again that's still tying a patron to a specific title so we had to get that going and you know evergreen has the ability to do uh, handle both as well um, so that those were two things we had to address and then we talked about the new uh, having new retention periods um, and again we were saying all right well what's the operational need and that was you know, being able to bill a patron if there's a damaged item. Um, do you really need that data for a year um, to do that? And certainly there were cases where the damaged item didn't get noticed until after a year after it was returned. Um, it happens, I guess, if you're not checking it when things are checked in. Uh, but, you know, for the most part, and this one went to our CERC policy committee, they determined that really 90 days was uh, how long um, we needed that information. So we moved that to 90 days. Uh, we also changed our uh, some of our settings for when we regularly purge patrons. Um, so it's three years after the privilege expiration, but we also started include, including any patrons with overdue fines or lost card fees. So things that weren't directly tied to material return. We said, okay, you know what? We don't need to keep those patrons in the system any longer, even if they have fees on their account. So, you know, for a lot of our libraries, they had gone fine free during the pandemic and shortly thereafter. So that was, you know, it wasn't a hard pill to swallow. Um, the other one we did is we uh, added a new purge to purge patrons after seven years. And those would be the patrons who still had lost materials fees or other types of fees on their accounts. Um, one thing we've you know, asked is, well, how long is the statute of limitations for uh, that? And you know, how long can we actually hold patrons legally accountable for those fees? Um, so that's where the seven years came from. And, um, you know, checking on state law and things like that is important. Uh, and those got purged. There were patrons in there who had a bill back in 2000. Um, 
that money was never going to go back. We didn't even know if that patron was still in the area. So I think, you know, there was, when we pulled the data together, there were like tens of thousands of dollars that we were getting rid of when we implemented this policy. But when you're looking at bills that are 20 years old, you're not going to get that money anyways. It's just, you know, it's fake. Um, one thing to, if you do something like this to prepare libraries for is their stats. Their uh, state stats of number of patrons are going to go way down after a process like this is run. This was the biggie. Um, we removed title and author information from notices. Um, this came from the task force. I actually did not push for this one. Um, and it, it definitely generated the most discussion among our membership. And, um, and I was surprised that we did it as a requirement for all of our libraries that they no longer have title and author information from notices anymore. Um, and at first I was reluctant, but as the discussion unfolded, you'd hear people talk about, you know, young adults um, who don't want their family to know they're borrowing LGBTQ titles, um, sensitive medical issues. Uh, there was talk of the, one of our library directors talked about a patron who was in a violent ma marriage and her husband didn't want her reading romance novels, which she loved. Um, so we, you know, those were the kind of scenarios we were thinking about and how easy it is to just, we already didn't have that information in text notices um, because texts need to be small. We didn't have that information in voice. Um, we had automated voice notification. We didn't have that information there because you never know who's picking up the phone. And so this was just moving that to email. Um, and it was, um, that was a really tough one. The, it was the only recommendation that went forward to our membership that had votes in opposition to it. There were two votes opposed to it. Uh, our task force had talked about doing maybe patron opt-in for getting titles and authors in their notices. At the time, we thought it would have doubled the number of notices we scheduled. Um, other things we considered were um, truncating the title so that it's just like when I get my CVS prescription notice, you get the first three letters of the um, title. It would have to honor non-filing indicators so that um, the title wouldn't just say the, because um, that's not useful. Um, we talked about that and we thought it would actually be more confusing for patrons for one thing. And also that, you know, if you have a um, someone getting a book on divorce that starts with DIV, it might be kind of clear that that's what the title was. So, so we didn't move forward with that. Uh, and we implemented the policy. I was had the privilege of being the first executive director of this consortium who actually had someone fill out a patron complaint form that had been on our website for years uh, if a patron had complaints about uh, consortium policy. We had several of them. And after those complaints came through, we went back to the drawing board. Obviously, this is another system, not evergreen. If we figured out a way we could do it without doubling the number of notices, but when we brought it to our board, they said, no, let's see if they can get used to it for it first before we make any changes. So we gave them six months and um, surveyed our directors and finally right before I left um, we uh, did set it up so patrons could opt into these uh, but but that was a, a really tricky one and I you know I could see both sides of it uh, we you know we did really style our notices we had html notices so we looked at amazon's notice that had a big button because they don't put your uh product information and emails anymore. There's a big button to go click to access your account. And we kind of copied that idea and put them in there. Didn't help um, with some of the patrons. So uh, the good news about that is it uh, redirected focus away from the issue that I wanted to deal with, which was the PIN password policy. It was just terrible. Our staff could see patron PINs. I, I, my first week in that job, I wanted to get rid of it. It, it took a while. Um, 
you know, pins the last four digits of the patron's phone numbers. That's not really a safe policy either. I know a lot of people do it. Um, so the change we went forward with is storing them so they're hashed and salted. Evergreen, that just happens automatically. This isn't an issue that any of you will have to deal with, and you shouldn't because all software should work this way. We also changed it so we call it passwords now. And actually at Noble, we just made this change. And you know, the reason we do that is it just makes the user feel like it can be more complex than if you call it a PIN. Because PIN, you think of your bank PIN, four digit number, which isn't as secure. We ended up, even though um, we hashed and salted the PINs, we ended up keeping the four digit minimum for passwords. And the reason is one of my goals, and I put this on a launch pad bug today, is to remove the staff member from the middle of this interaction where a patron is setting a password. Uh, the, the staff member should have as little involvement in that as pos possible. And the software we were using, really you couldn't, you could set a strong password, but you couldn't enforce that strong password through the public interface. Um, what would happen is it would have to be it, it would have to be happen through the patron editor, and I, I didn't want to do that. There was nothing that when they logged into the catalog that would say, "Hey, your password's not strong enough. Here, why don't you make it stronger?" And um, so I was waiting for that to get improved before we go up to more complex pins. As it so happens, Evergreen has this problem too. So I do have a link to a bug that um, talks about this. We actually had that in the old JS pack, and I don't even know how many people here remember that catalog, uh, but it was not the best. Uh, but, um, you know, the ability to have the catalog prompt you. Um, and ask you for a stronger password in when you're logging in and to force you to do that. Uh, so that that is a huge thing um, that I think is needed in any system because that's pretty much how most websites work these days. Um, and I do know that there is another bug out there that is working on more uh, of a password system, but I don't think it's actually addressing this specific need. Um, but anything you can do with password security and not having a um, staff get in the middle of the interaction, because of the way we create accounts, the staff have to get involved at some level because they have to create the initial password. And whether that's a four-digit number or what, that's fine. But, you know, having the actual user then deal with any more password issues. So... That one led me to talk about a feature I would like to see in Evergreen to strengthen privacy. And that's a segue into our next Padlet for all of you to tell me where you think um, any development you think Evergreen could do to improve privacy. So I'm gonna send you a link to a Padlet. So this would be based on anything that we've gone over, anything you've seen in the checklist, or things that you've always wanted to see Evergreen do that would improve uh, our privacy, uh, our protection of privacy and confidentiality. So I'm gonna, uh, I put in a link to the Padlet in the um, one of the chats, and Katie will put it in the other chat, the feed loop chat. I forgot the name of the platform we're using. Um, and if you could just kind of put some development ideas up there, this one has a like button, but I'm going to ask you to hold off on using the like button for now. But if you just want to put up ideas here, and if you see something that looks like yours or is similar, try adding a comment to it rather than doing your own uh, note sticky for it. And I'm going to put my idea in there, the one I just said. All 
Oh, I don't need to because someone else already did it. Also, I want to let you know that if there's anything you add to this, I'm going to be checking to make sure that um, these are already in Launchpad in one form or another. And if there isn't anything, I'll put it in Launchpad on your behalf so that we can see, um, you know, how the process works. So we're in an open source community. We can make all of this happen if we want to. All right, I'm going to give about one more minute for this in case anyone um, still working on it. Really, Andrea, get to work on that. Well, I guess I shouldn't be responding to a chat in Zoom when I was responding to Andrea saying that she it's just reminded that she needs to file a bug for MFA. Okay, actually, um, if anyone, you can still keep working on this because I'm going to have something else for you to add, which may seem like the opposite to what we've been talking about today. But now I'd like you to add to this Padlet um, are there features fraught with privacy concerns that you would like to see implemented in Evergreen in a responsible manner? And I'm going to give you an example of um, what I mean here. Um, so 
one I didn't mention this in my presentation because this isn't an issue in every green, so so why? One of the uh, concerns from our privacy audit is in the software you were using, staff could see, um, could have the option to see the circulation history of their patron. So patron decides they want to keep their reading history, their circ history, and if they did that, the staff could also see it in the patron editor, which is a privacy concern. It is not something that you can do in Evergreen, assuming because it's a privacy concern. But, you know, we had a lot of small libraries and um, one of their, cons what they would talk about, it was always the older patrons, they would talk about that there were people who really, you know, they didn't remember what they read and they just, they weren't going to log into the catalog to see their history. Um, and, you know, there were certain cases where it was important that we they saw it. And my thought was, wouldn't it be nice if you just at least had an opt-in to see it? And, and maybe, you know, that could be a feature that would be okay as long as there was that consent there. So, so that's what I, I'm using as an example. So are there features, uh, recommendation engines or other things that have come up in the past that maybe we've hesitated working on because of the privacy issues, but maybe we would be the right people to implement it because we know we would do it the correct way and take care of those privacy issues. So that's what I mean. So if you have any ideas for that, go ahead and add them to this Padlet. but I'm not seeing much activity here. So maybe people are okay with this. Katie, can people unmute themselves here? If they are in Zoom, they definitely can. I think they also can if they're in feed loop is yes. So yes, they should be able to. I'm just wondering if the person who wrote about the RESTful API, I don't know if everyone who's here knows what how what that work would do. Could like uh, explain it a little bit more. Oh, I like that clean slate one. That was Andrea. Can you unmute yourself, Andrea, or is that? I think so. Check one, two. Okay. Yes, I hear I you. I do not have, I am not, do not have a microphone hooked in, so I, there's probably going to be background uh, noise. I can hear you perfectly. Great. Well, there's still probably going to be going to be background noise. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, RESTful API. Um, this is basically a way to update uh, the APIs that underpin Evergreen, um, or that allow Evergreen, the, the, sorry, <laughs> I did not prepare myself, Kathy. Um, so an API is something that lets um, a third party software you know, product, company, whatever, use Evergreen's data. Um, and ideally it lets it use it in a controlled manner um, where you can decide what they see and what they don't see and, you know, give them access to only really what they need to provide the services. And Kathy has, you know, done a lot of talking today about how some of the third-party services are better 
um, at this than others. And you do have to be really mindful of what you're allowing those third party services. But what I can tell you from the uh, service provider for the vendor standpoint um, is that we definitely get requests from some of these third party services. They're like, oh yeah, um, we're just gonna need database access. And we're like, no, no you do not get that. Um, <laughs> but the problem that they have is that they wanna get you know, specific information and they don't know how to ask Evergreen for this. So what hopefully RESTful API is gonna do um, is it's going to bring Evergreen's API infrastructure um, up into a more modern, a well-documented framework so that third-party vendors can just look at our APIs, look at our API documentation and say, oh, here's how I get that information from Evergreen. I can go ahead and make a request for this specific thing. And on your side, your administrator's side, you can say, oh yeah, this vendor gets credentials. Here's their secret key. They can ask for these specific kinds of information. So like if they're doing, you know, uh, fancy notices or something like that, you know, they can get you know, patron names and email addresses, and maybe that's it. Um, if they're doing something with circulation, maybe they get, you know, specific kinds of circulation data, et cetera. So that's um, kind of my rambling introduction to what that is going to do. And there is um, a proposal that I believe ECDI is currently weighing that that um, I will try to find the uh, link for here and drop into chat in a sec. Thank you. If you don't find it, holler, I got you. Thanks, Ruth. That was perfect. So, I feel per I feel very called out by this slide since I just rambled very unsimply. So you know, okay. <laughs> uh, but you did a great job because you know your you know your stuff. So that's what matters. Um, so what I'm going to ask everyone to do now that we have this pad and that gave time for people to finish putting their Padlet stuff in, um, go in and pick the three of these that you think would be the greatest to see in Evergreen and go ahead and like those. And this will give us an idea if there are things that that are really people are gathering around and think should be done in the system. And I will certainly share, and if there is something that comes out high, I certainly will share that on any launch pad bug that's out there. So, as coordinator for the ECD, I also want to do a little shout out here that there is going to come a time when uh, RESTful API is developed and there is going to come a time when multi-factor authentication is developed. And in order to get them in the software, uh, they need to be tested. And so um, I'd like to encourage anybody that's in here with the wherewithal to participate in getting those things, they're highly technical. I mean, this is this is uh, not necessarily something that your CERC staff is gonna be looking at at an administrative interface. Uh, so I'm talking to sysadmins and, and, and others in the, of that bent to prepare yourselves, if at all possible, to help us with testing. Thank you for that shout out, Ruth. I see a lot of people doing the first password reset on first login. So I feel happy that I did my job by uh, really highlighting that before we went into this exercise. And Andrea, I mean, you must have done a good job on the RESTful API because that one's coming out high too. Hey, well, I mean, look, it's it's important. And it the astute among you might have noticed that that uh, spec that I linked is labeled part one. There is, in fact, going to be a part two, which will add all kinds of uh, nice interfaces uh, to do this in. So you don't have to like, you know, bug a, you know, a sysadmin to, to do it via the command line or something like that. It'll have interfaces where you can manage this as, as well as a public interface where you can allow select third party vendors to manage it themselves. So that is that is what part two well, will entail. But we're not there. Yet. Let me say the inappropriate thing because I'm good at it. Yeah, we, we uh, can on that, the that first part. the first part is the foundation. I mean, it is the infrastructure and it is amazing. It is the highly technical. The second part 
once we get the infrastructure, it is the sexy part. And, and it is pretty freaking amazing if I do say so my own self. Um, so, but we got to do the first part first. I don't understand why that was inappropriate, but thank you. Uh, well, because I was going to say, there's definitely a slide in our presentation, Ruth, where I talk about infrastructure and how it's sexy. So maybe I should change that. No, don't. I mean, we were almost going to leave the title what it was. So um, before I get maybe. back to my presentation, there's a question in the Zoom chat on the topic of multi authentic multi-factor authentication is there any progress on the app in the pipeline boy is there ever no um, I think there, I are, are you but here uh, hold on i'm going to interrupt uh is keen are you talking about the mobile app oh my bus yeah i think i think the conversation is about hemlock there and that oh i'm gonna i'm gonna speak for keen and keen if you're here please feel free to um unmute uh but i i don't think because um this individual is a staff person at one of the spark libraries i do think that that is about staff client login oh okay i could be wrong but we don't typically promote him some of us okay, use him okay. we don't promote it so i don't i don't think that's what it is Okay, um, then you can go back. I, I It hasn't died, but I will let um, either Andrea or Ruth answer it. Wait, so we are asking- Oh, I was wrong. Question? No, he is, okay. So uh, Hemlock is still around. I, I myself use it. Um, there are some libraries certainly that use a number of third-party apps. Okay, so I don't it, know it that there that. was ever, if there okay. was discussion about MFA in Hemlock, I'm not familiar with it. I don't think that there is, but Hemlock is the quote unquote evergreen app, but there are many other apps that integrate with, um, but somebody to talk to about that, which you might have already said that is a yeah, I, I, Mr. Cox. Ken yeah, Ken Cox, Ken yeah. Cox, and I'm actually planning to invite him to the Hackaway, so um, I don't know if he'll go again, but um, maybe we can talk to him about it then. All right, I'm going to get back to my presentation because I do have a little bit left and I want to leave a little time for questions. Luckily, this last part is not going to take long, and my sheet screen is still share showing, right? Yes, have okay. Um, so privacy policies, um, again, I think I mentioned in the beginning, I, I did not get to this because um, my chair of my privacy audit chat task force had some things she had to deal with that put us on hiatus and then uh, she left and then by the time she left and I knew I needed to get a new chair, I knew I was going to be leaving soon. So I, I kind of left them in the middle of a privacy uh, before we were done with everything. Um, but you know, this is another thing to, and I'm going the wrong way. Why am I having troubles with this? Um, the big thing about privacy policy tips, you know, there was a plain law writing act of 2010 that says you should write these in, uh, you know, plain, Eng I don't want to say plain English, but really in very easy to understand language. I know the noble privacy policy was actually, I just looked at the date earlier today, was approved before 2010. So, and I think that's true for a lot of consortia and libraries. So this is something to think about, be conversational, use headings, avoid jargon. Um, another big thing on privacy policies, notify users of the privacy poly policy when they register for a card. So if you're sending a welcome to the library uh, email every time someone registers for a card, it might be a good idea to include information about the privacy policy there. And then the other thing is you really should be notifying users whenever you change that privacy policy, whenever it's updated, have a way to notify users about that. Um, I linked to some sample uh, privacy policies. Uh, San Jose Public Library is really good. I'm going to show you that one in a second, but Swan Library Services, I included theirs because, you know, they did theirs in 2020. It's clear and 
written, it's very easy to understand, and they're a consortium, which is a little bit, you know, public libraries are de dealing with different issues than the consortium that really is talking about the data and certain services um, have. So I thought that would be useful. Um, the only quibble I have with this one is they do say there are times that staff might ask for your password for troubleshooting and that just makes me twitchy. Um, I, so um, I, I, I prefer to troubleshoot without asking people for their password. Uh, so I'm going to show, oh, I did not want to do that. I wanted to click on a link. I'm not supposed to sh show my surprises before I'm ready. Um, San Jose Public Library, clearly up top, what information do we collect? And they outline it right here, all of the information they collect. They talk about what they specifically say, what Google Analytics is collecting, who has access to the information. It's just uh, one of the uh, most clearly written policies I've seen out there. Um, so I, I really think it's a good example um, to look at. Uh, I, I've attended presentations that done on this. Um, so it, it really is good. And then, of course, they have the thing at the bottom uh, for people who can't see this that says this library has not been served with a government subpoena or national security letter under Section 215 of the USA Patriot Act. If this notice is removed, customers can assume that a subpoena or national security letter has been served. Um, that was interesting. I didn't know libraries were still doing that. Uh, that that was big around the time the Patriot Act was uh, was passed. But I think they're a really good example to look at, and, and definitely look at the Swan one as well. Um, and then I'd link to uh, on that ALA website, the same one that has the checklists and the guidelines. They have created privacy policies field guides. They, these field guides did not exist when I did my last audit. So, you know, it's a nice thing. Uh, they go into depth on uh, certain issues and they have one specific to privacy policies, but it's not just about writing a pri actually writing a pro privacy policy is secondary on this. It's really about reading privacy policy from you, policies from your vendors, which is just as important because you're working with a lot of vendors and you really should be reading the privacy policy of each and every one and, and getting involved and, you know, talking about it during your contract negotiations with these vendors. So um, that's all I'm going to say about that because we do have about 10 minutes left. Uh, I do have the last picture of Q-tip because he was not happy that he didn't get much FaceTime in the previous two photos. This one was actually taken in March 2020 when he was showing us how he could socially distant. Um, so, but that's just the cat. Um, but uh, if you have questions that aren't cat related, I'm happy to answer them. And I'm going to stop sharing too, so I can maybe see some faces. No, everyone's hiding. I don't know if I count, but I'll turn my video on. <laughs> of course, you always, you always count. Yes, but I'm the moderator, so. Has anyone been through this process who found something that didn't come up in my presentation that they w would like to share? All right, well then I hope it's because my presentation was clear and left no questions and not that I left you thoroughly confused.
Bradley, go ahead. What's the cat question? So Joan says, CW Mars regularly runs reports to find personal IDs and patron records. We follow up with libraries. Um, yeah, and actually Jeanette shared that query with me at one point um, too. Uh, even though I was on another system, I figured I could figure out how it worked. And um, But I don't think we saw a problem in our system with uh, personal IDs being in there. Uh, I, I don't know if we just didn't know where to look. Uh, but but I know CW Mars had a lot of issues with with notes too, and the information that's in there. This can be tricky. And I know this because, like I said, Jeanette and I did a uh, presentation together at our New England Library Association. I know, Katie. I'm thinking we can finish up five minutes early. Yep, I, I think my uh, East Coast uh, time zone bias is, is showing <laughs> after five. Well, thanks everyone for coming and listening. And, you know, I hopefully you know where to find me if you have uh, any other additional questions after this. And I will note that everybody uh, has the ability to share their uh, contact information in um, their Feedloop profiles if they want to. You can also uh, message Kathy through the Feedloop profile uh, platform if you uh, would like to trade contact info or anything like that. And um, as always, the slides and recordings are going to be uh, linked as soon as we kind of get everything uh, wrapped up and processed from the conference. So you can look forward to having that resource as well. I know I always enjoy uh, looking at people's slides uh, after our, later on when I'm doing research on stuff. So Kathy, thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. Anytime, that was fun. And I would expect we will see all of you tomorrow at the Evergreen Conference proper. Have a good night, everyone.